You've probably had an opportunity to see the great painting by the 16th century Italian artist Raphael called School of Athens. And if you recall, you may have seen it, as I was fortunate enough to see it in <clears throat> Rome in the Vatican Museum. Plato and Aristotle occupy the central place in that masterful work that manages to convey so much about their philosophies through convey, they convey, he conveys it through showing their expressions and gestures in that painting. Plato's expression, the center of the painting, as he looks towards Aristotle, is one of tolerance, we might say, of wisdom, no trace of impatience. In a single gesture, Plato signals his philosophical base, and that base happens to be in the transcendental world of archetypal models, of patterns, of ideals, of visions, and the gesture is on high. Uh, he's holding his most metaphysical work in his hand, not the Republic, but the Timaeus, and as he gestures to Aristotle, he's saying, this is the essence of my philosophy, idealism. Aristotle's gesture is a very different one. He's looking toward Plato with an outstretched hand, and his hand, at least as I interpret the painting, is indicating not the transcendental world of divine forms, nor, as we'll see when we turn to Machiavelli next time, uh, the realistic world of human nature and the aggression and wickedness of man, but rather Aristotle's hand is gesturing to the mean, the golden mean. It's an outstretched hand that, in a single gesture, reproves Plato, as well as, I think, acknowledges just what he learned. Remember, Aristotle was Plato's student from ages 17 to 37. For 20 years, he studied with Plato in the academy. And then after that, as a superstar teacher, he founded his own school, the Lyceum in Athens. And when he was finally in 322 forced to flee Athens, Aristotle said it so well, he said, I am leaving Athens lest Athens sin a second time against philosophy. The first time, of course, was when they did pour Socrates away. He had founded his school, the Lyceum, and he had to desert that school. He died shortly after. Aristotle manages then to set forth a philosophy that seems to me is such a compliment to Plato, because any teacher who aspires to greatness must measure, it seems to me, his achievement against not just his students' greatness, but how far his students criticize his message. There are those who argue on the basis of Plato's Republic that Plato was a dogmatist. If he was such a dogmatist, how could he have inspired so much criticism in Aristotle's mind that is far from brainwashing and indoctrinating Aristotle, he turned Aristotle into the most famous of all his students. The doctrine that Aristotle set forth, the doctrine of the golden mean, argues that Plato has violated a basic truth. And that basic truth, according to Aristotle, is never in excess, never to the extreme, never go to the revolutionary length that Plato is willing to go to. And when we look now at the politics, we'll see that Aristotle feels that in every sense, it should have been possible for Plato to have conformed to a wiser, more judicious way of thinking that wouldn't have allowed Plato to commit the extremist heresies that he did when Plato advocated the abolition of the family, the elevation of women, the consolidation of rule in the hands of an elite few. All of that, from Aristotle's point of view, was abhorrent. The mean, then, the doctrine of the mean advocates that in most forms of human behavior, there is a wise course of action which does not go to either extreme. For example, courage. What is courage? Aristotle defines courage as intelligence, 
in the face of danger. It is not, on the one hand, foolhardiness. It's not, on the other hand, cowardice. It is acting in a courageous manner. It's not that courage, then, is a watered-down compromise. Not at all. It's simply a mean form of behavior. And the mean form of behavior attains a certain perfect pitch of its own. I like to call this the Goldilocks idea in political theory. And that is, remember, with a soup, not too hot, not too cold, but just right. And that's what Aristotle is saying. It is just right. So with the handling of money, there is, from Aristotle's point of view, in terms of handling money, a mean, a golden mean form of behavior. One does not hoard money. It's extreme stinginess. One does not waste money and spend it as though it's going out of style. Rather, one uses money in an appropriate way. One is generous. One is liberal. One conforms to basic norms of charity and liberality. And that's the mean form of behavior. When he says to Plato, why do you insist that your guardian give up all gold and silver? That's an inhuman form of behavior. Individuals don't do that. And as we'll see when we go to the politics, from Aristotle's point of view, it just violates a basic truth about human nature, that naturally we like to have money. And that we use money, we use it wisely, as a liberal, charitable form of behavior. The golden mean, then, can be achieved in all respects. Aristotle says, not quite in all respects. There is, he says in the Ethics, no such thing as committing adultery with the right woman at the right time in the right place. That's not the golden mean. There are some forms of behavior that are absolutely wrong. But for the most part, we can generalize about attaining a golden mean of behavior. And so what is Aristotle's overall response to Plato? As he looks at him in Raphael's painting, he's saying, cool it, Plato. There is just too much revolutionary optimism in your philosophy. There is, what we want is never an excess. What we want is a mean form of behavior. It would be wrong to imply that Aristotle learned nothing from Plato. Of course he did, a great deal. He learned, and we'll contrast this with Machiavelli next time, next lecture, he learned that there is an important and essential truth to the question, what course of life is best? And that truth is that we search for values or moral behavior, and that search is right and legitimate and good and true. And so when we search, of course, for the mean form of behavior, we are not in any way deriding values. We want a state that will support our quest for the good life. It's just that we don't want Plato's communal state. We don't want his guardians. But we do want a state that will help us in our search for justice. In that way, he conformed to ba Plato's basic truth. And remember this when we turn to Machiavelli Next time, it is important because Machiavelli will say, the opening of our comments will emphasize this, that there is no relationship between ethics and politics. That is, we have politics as the real world and we have ethics, the world of fantasy and utopia. Never the twain shall meet. From Aristotle's point of view, that's wrong. Plato has gone to an extreme, but we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. We don't want to argue that there is no virtue in politics. There should be virtue in politics. Ethics and politics are inextricably interwoven. He learned that from Plato. But where did he disagree with Plato? Well, in vital respects. The politics begins with a word, a single word, that says a lot about Aristotle's philosophy. The word is observation. It's a word that we don't find in the Republic. Plato never tries to validate his truths by appealing to observation, empirical validation. Plato's gesture is on high, but we can know the truth as we know it, Plato would say, in geometry, through a <clears throat> kind of search for an ideal Euclidean line that we imagine, and because we can imagine that line, even though we cannot reproduce it ever, it's true. There is such a thing as a Euclidean line. From Aristotle's point of view, we can't observe a Euclidean line. And so there is, from Aristotle's philosophy, one test, and that is the empirical test. Observation shows us, he begins, 
And we may therefore hold on the basis of what we actually observe that all associations aim at such good, especially the state. Now, the part about all associations aiming at such at a good is certainly Plato. But the part about observation is Aristotle. What else does Aristotle say that's to differ from Plato? He has a fascinating analysis about of nature and what is natural. What is natural to us all? And listen to this, the way in which he discourses on what is natural. His father was a doctor and Aristotle was a student of biology, a student of biology who took the method of science very seriously. If we think of Plato as a student in many respects of mathematics and Aristotle as a student of biology, we can contrast the two methods that they have. For Aristotle, he's speaking always of what can be observed in nature. We shall best be able, in this as in other fields, he's speaking of politics now, to attain scientific conclusions, because he does believe that there is such a thing as the science of politics, by the method we employ. First of all, there must necessarily be a union or pairing of those who cannot exist without one another. Male and female must unite for the reproduction of the species, not from deliberate intention, but from a natural impulse which exists in animals generally, as it also exists in plants, to leave behind them something of the same nature as themselves. And it seems to be unexceptional, that is, he's arguing what is natural, that <clears throat> mating is natural. Next, there must necessarily be a union of the naturally ruling element. Here comes the kick. The naturally ruling element with the element which is naturally ruled for the preservation of both. The element which is able by virtue of its intelligence to exercise forethought is naturally a ruling and master element. The element which is able by virtue of its bodily power to do what the other element plans is a ruled element, which is naturally in a state of slavery. And master and slave have accordingly, as they thus complete one another, a common interest, one ruling and one ruled. Now, He's addressing himself to Plato's first wave. And you remember what that first wave is, that women may rule. Having established that there are naturally ruling and naturally ruled elements on the basis of what we actually observe, Plato's, uh, Aristotle says it's obvious that the relation of male to female is naturally that of the superior to the inferior, of the ruling to the rule. The general principle must similarly hold good of all human beings generally, and therefore also of the relation of masters to slaves. Now, this argument that the relationship of male to female is naturally one of ruled, male being, of course, the ruler to the ruled women, this argument is essential for Aristotle's view of politics because he's responding to Plato's heretical revolutionary notion, remember, that women may rule. He is horrified at the extremism that this implies, as all Greeks would have been at this time, because Plato is unique, he is unprecedented, he's singular in his assertion at this time that women may perform a political function. Here's Aristotle's argument. Further, the soul has naturally two elements, a ruling and a ruled, and each has its different goodness one belonging to the rational and ruling element and the other to the irrational and ruled. What is true of the soul or the human self is evidently also true of the other cases. And we may thus conclude, whether we look at the household or the state, that it is a general law that there should be naturally ruling elements and elements naturally ruled. The rule of the free man over the slave is one kind of rule, that of the male over the female is another, that of the grown man over the child another. The slave is naturally ruled because the slave is entirely without the faculty of reason. The female indeed possesses it, but in a form which remains ineffective. There is the heart. Feminist critics, of course, go back to this line. And they go back to it sometimes with a real vengeance, as, for example, Sarah Pomeroy, who has written a book just on Plato and Aristotle, comparing uh, the two of them. And uh, she says in this uh, book on wives, slaves, goddesses, and whores, she calls it, uh, that various views of women in Athens, led by Aristotle especially, 
that the woman under no circumstances must perform any political function, own any property, leave her traditional role of good mother, faithful wife, and above all, supportive of the ruler of the household, the patriarch, a patriarch. What is true of their possessing different parts of the soul must similarly be held true of their possessing moral goodness. The woman may not, because she has no reason, or reason rather is ineffective within her, she must not, cannot attain the same heights of moral goodness as the male, because the male, rational, also has the capacity to achieve moral goodness. We must therefore hold that what the poet Sophocles said of a woman, and this is what Sophocles said of women, a modest silence is a woman's crown. A saying which implies that there is a special form of goodness for women, this contains a general truth, but a truth which does not apply to men. Now that's Aristotle's then critique of the first wave, that is of Plato's theory that women may rule. And notice the devastating nature of this critique. I think it was charitable of you not to hiss as my students at Barnard College do when I read that comment. Isophocles, a women's college, has very little tolerance of the maxim, a modest silence is a woman's crown. But the, the argument, of course, here is rooted in what? It's rooted in nature. It's rooted in observation. It's rooted in a generalization about the self, the personality, the soul. He says, look around you. I mean, women, they're hysterical. In various works, Aristotle will point to biological reasons why they are so hysterical, menstruated and all the rest. You can't have irrational types like that ruling our polis. It's necessary, it's logical, but above all, it's traditionally ordained that women then remain in this position. That is the mean. If we could look around us through observation and see women functioning in positions of rule, then maybe we could infer that women performing those functions deserve to perform them. Quite the opposite. We look around us and everywhere we see women doing very well. And the first part of this text is devoted to home economics as practitioners of home economics, but not, not outside of the home. I want you to note particularly, though, how this is a doctrine of the mean, as Aristotle insists it is. That is, Aristotle is saying, look, in most cases, women are treated as slaves in families. I don't want that. I want women to be treated with respect so far as they fulfill their valuable, their indispensable role in the family as good wives, faithful wives, and productive mothers, especially as sons. We want those role, that role to be fulfilled. So what do we have then? We have again the mean. On the one hand, we avoid the extreme of what Plato and all of his revolutionary ardor is encouraging. Take the women out of the family. Some women, women with intelligence out of the family, put them in ruling positions. On the other hand, treating women as slaves and abusing them as such. We don't want either of those two extremes. We want rather keeping women where they are in the family, performing the role that nature has ordained that they should perform. If that's the first wave, then how does Aristotle treat the second? Linked to the, the second wave, to the first, rather. And that is, he feels that Plato's argument about the abolition of property and the nuclear family is just basically flawed. It again, as we were saying before, goes to the extreme of not acknowledging uh, the right role of the family. <clears throat> what is the right role of the family? Well, from Aristotle's point of view, it's clear that the family nurtures an individual, especially a male, to perform a political function because after the family, having been socialized in the values of duty and loyalty to the larger unit, then one becomes a citizen. If it weren't for the family, if we abolish the family, we're not going to have that step, that essential, vital, natural step in socializing people to knowing about what they should do in the state. Plato's whole concept, then, from Aristotle's point of view, and the words that he uses here throughout the politics is devastating. When he wants to say that something is wrong, he says, it's just impractical. It will never work. It's a dream. It's an idle fantasy. It's a utopia. And from Aristotle's point of view, we must be practical. 
So Plato's concept of abolishing the family and abolishing the uh, institution of private property, some people won't take to that. Now, why? Look at his reasoning here in the second book of the politics. What is common to the greatest number, he says, gets the least amount of care. And Plato's idea of a communal family will elicit the least amount of care. Men pay attention most to what is their own. They care less for what is common, or at any rate, they care for it only to the extent to which each is individually concerned. Even where there is no other case for inattention, men are more prone to neglect their duty when they think that another is attending to it. The scheme of Plato means that each citizen will have a thousand sons. Now, Plato didn't say that. But he did say that in this large communal family, that the son will not know his father and mother. That is, the family, the nuclear family unit, will be abolished to that extent Then Aristotle is fair in his criticism. Each citizen will have a thousand sons. They will not be the sons of each citizen individually. Any and every son will be equally the son of any and every father. And the result will be that every son will be equally neglected by every father. Aristotle's criticism here is based upon his pragmatism. And I want you to see how he introduces a line of thought here that becomes increasingly important. And that is summed up in his argument, men pay most attention to what is their own. When he, when he argues against Plato's idea of the abolition of private property, he'll repeat the same point. That is, people want to possess an object and make it their own. It's natural that that occur. We can't go against nature. Now he's talking about one of his favorite subjects because Aristotle has written a whole book uh, within the ethics on friendship. And he speaks about friendship and the spirit of fraternity. He says the spirit of fraternity is likely to exist to a much less degree where the family is communal. It would be merely if Plato's large family were constructed, a communal family, it would be merely in Plato's Republic a watery sort of fraternity. A father would be very little disposed to say mine of a son, and a son would be as little disposed to say mine of a father. Just as a little sweet wine mixed with a great deal of water produces a tasteless mixture, so family feeling is diluted and tasteless when family names have so little meaning as they have in a constitution of the Platonic order, and when there is so little reason for a father treating his sons as sons, or a son treating his father as a father, or brothers one another as brothers, there are two things which particularly move men to care for an object and to feel affection for that object. One of them is that the object should belong to yourself. The other is that you must enjoy it. Neither of these motives can exist among men who live in a constitution such as the Platonic. Now, the crucial issue again here is private possession. Aristotle is arguing that we derive joy from our children because we know them as our children and we possess them. Indeed, as children, we're often possessed as property. We, enjoy, we derive joy from knowing our spouse. We possess that spouse we own that spouse, as, of course, males literally own females in the traditional family in Greece, and we derive joy from that. Don't, Aristotle is saying, disrupt that natural feeling of possession, because if you do that, you'll destroy a basic emotion that's nurtured rightly in human nature. It's right to feel possessiveness. It is wrong to try to smash it. The last wave, that, or rather the second part, I should say, of the second wave, remember, was the institution of private property. And Aristotle is so concerned over responding to the, to the second wave, as we've called it, that is, Plato's abolition of family and private property, he devotes page after page to it in the politics. And uh, let's look carefully at what he says about abolishing private property, and then uh, summarize again his response to the to the uh, second wave. The better system, he says, 
is that under which property is privately owned, but is put to common use. And the function proper to the legislature is to make men so disposed that they will treat property in this way. Now, he's arguing a difficult proposition here because he's trying to get to the mean. He's responding to those critics who say, if you sanction the accumulation of private property, you will then go to the extreme of allowing individuals to hoard unlimited amounts of private property. He's against usury. He's against hoarding. He's against the accumulation of property. And he says early on in the politics that a mean must always observe a limit. It's wrong for individuals to accumulate property and money in an unlimited way because that's exceeding the mean. Now, how can we institute a system of property then in the polis that will avoid that excess? And he comes up with this formula of a kind of trusteeship. Uh, that is, that individuals who are wealthy and who have a great deal of land allow it to be commonly used allow land or allow funds to be distributed on their behalf. Strong advocate then of philanthropy. When he argues this, he's arguing, as we'll see later, a basic capitalist idea, of course, that is the sanctity of private property. But he's trying to argue against the idea that the sanctity of private property initiates endless accumulation of wealth and property. Because from his point of view, it's right to have. So we'll see a middle class kind of government in which individuals own a good deal of property and enjoy that property that will not necessarily lead to the accumulation of more and more and more. He continues, there's a further consideration which must be taken into account. This is the consideration of natural pleasure. Here too, as well as in the matter of goodness, to think of a thing as your own makes an inexpressible difference. The satisfaction of a natural feeling of this kind brings pleasure. And it may well be that regard for oneself and by extension for what is one's own is a feeling planted, implanted by nature and not a mere random impulse. It's no accident then that Aristotle is often seen as the granddaddy of the bourgeois capitalist system, because here he's arguing in those terms that it is a natural feeling to feel, and not a random impulse, uh, to feel uh, that what you possess, what is your own, gives you enormous pleasure. The simple feeling of love for any of these things, self, children, property, or money, as he's including at all in terms of what we naturally and rightly feel love for, self, children, property, and money, the simple feeling of love for all of this is universal. We find in nature no exception. And he cites tribes that he's traveled to in Asia Minor, and he's observed this number of different peoples. We may add that a very great pleasure is to be found in doing a kindness and giving some help to friends or guests or comrades. And such kindness and help become possible only when property is privately owned. Isn't that a nice point, seems to me, that is, we can be charitable only if we have money. How can the guardians, Plato's elite rule, how can these people be charitable, human? How can they be generous when they cannot touch gold and silver? We have to allow people to earn some money in order for them to be generous. We cannot deprive them, then, of all wealth, as Plato would have, have it. Kindness becomes prop, uh, possible and only when private ownership is practiced. In a state which is excessively unified, as Plato's is, no man can show himself liberal or indeed do a liberal act, for the function of liberality consists in the proper use which is made of property. So liberality then becomes a, as we were saying before, mean between, on the one hand, stinginess, and on the other hand, a spendthrift kind of attitude. That's Aristotle's um, comment then on the fallacy of Plato's second wave. 
I want you to see in connection with this the way in which the argument is based upon traditional wisdom. No one before Plato, very few people since Plato, have argued that property should, private property should be abolished. But as we'll see, there's a direct parallel between Plato-Aristotle, or the Plato-Aristotle argument and the Marx-Freud argument that we'll be treating. Uh, that is, as in the case of Plato and Aristotle, we have a, with Plato, a revolutionary optimist saying, abolish all property, turn individuals into selfish, selfless types, altruistic, through a system of education in which they'll share everything. And Aristotle arguing on the basis of a concept of human nature and of nature itself, impossible. That kind of revolutionary optimism, flawed, it's dangerous. Just so we'll find Marx reviving Plato's argument and that saying that communism, a communal family, or the abolition of private property is necessary for the creation of a selfless polity. And Freud saying precisely on the property angle that this is, on the basis of what we know about human nature, impossible. Neither of them referring to Plato and Aristotle. But nevertheless, both of them, both Marx and Freud, re-articulating the same arguments that we find today with Plato and Aristotle. These arguments are fundamental to political theory. If we want change, how far can we obtain it? If we change human nature through, human, through education, in what direction? How far? And Rousseau will come in on this, and as we'll see the time after next today. Rousseau will argue we can just go so far, but we can achieve a polity based upon selflessness rather than selfishness. Identifying the selfishness with Aristotle, of course. Aristotle's critique of the third wave. Remember the third wave. The third wave was that philosophers should rule. That is, there should be an elite, a wise elite, ruling the polis. And Aristotle opposes this rule of an elite few categorically. And there is, he says, an element of danger in the method of government which Plato proposes to institute. He makes one body of persons the permanent rulers of his state, thus rejecting the principle of ruling and being ruled in turn. This is a system which must breed discontent and dissension. And so Aristotle says there is a kind of rule uh, that must be practiced, and that is rule of the middle class. Aristotle's become, in many respects, the person that we look to today when we try to sanction middle class rule. And I think he has been vindicated in many respects in terms of his arguments. There are, he says, certain qualifications that the middle class and only the middle class have. The number one qualification is, for the most part, the middle class are more educated than other people, certainly than the mob, the demos, the poor people that cannot afford to be educated. Uh, second, besides that, they have property. And in having property, they have a stake in the system, vital in order to maintain the stability that we want. And so, when he's talking about the way in which actual constitutions may be formed, he says this, we have now to consider what is the best constitution and the best way of life for the majority of states and men. We shall not employ a standard of excellence above the reach of ordinary men as Plato does. We shall only be concerned with the sort of life which most men are able to share and the sort of constitution which it is most possible for states to enjoy. See, Aristotle, the pragmatist, impatient with Plato's revolutionary ideal. If we adopt as true the statements that I have also made in the Ethics, his other great book, The Ethics, in which he sets forth his doctrine of the mean, that a truly happy life is a life of goodness and that goodness always consists in observing a mean, it follows that the best way of life for the majority of men is one which consists in a mean, and a mean of the kind attainable by every individual. 
In all states, there may be distinguished three parts or classes of the citizen body. The very rich, the very poor, and the middle class, which forms the mean. Now it's admitted as a general principle that moderation and the mean are always best. We may therefore conclude that a middle condition will be the best. Men who are in this condition are the most ready to listen to reason. Those who belong to either extreme, the overhandsome, the overstrong, the overnoble, the overwealthy, or at the opposite end, the overpoor, the overweak, the utterly ignoble, they all find it hard to follow the lead of reason. A nice blend here of Aristotle and Plato. Both want reason to rule, but in Plato's case, the rule of reason means selecting those individuals who have a special gift, a particular excellence of reason. They can become philosophers, elevating those people to the top. And with that special excellence, they become an elite. And that elite forms the ruling class. From Aristotle's point of view, reason still rules. But what is reason in Aristotle, from his point of view? Reason is just a sense of the mean. And what is the mean? Certainly property, wealth, some degree of wealth, but also a sense of the traditional family, a stake in the system, a knowledge of where you are, and not some metaphysical dream that Plato has in mind. The middle class, then, from Aristotle's point of view, can, it must be trusted. And as we trust that class, we go for stability. But we can still bank on reason. A state aims at being, as Aristotle says, as far as it can be, a society composed of equals and peers who, as such, can be friends and associates. And the middle class, more than any other, has this sort of composition. It follows that a state which is based on the middle class is bound to be the best constituted in respect of the elements, i.e. equals and peers, of which, on our view, a state must naturally be composed. The middle class, then, from Aristotle's point of view, is the way to go. Now, let's look at the whole argument. The argument, remember, is not a revolutionary argument. It's a reformist argument. From Aristotle's point of view, if we look around his world, we see rule by what? Rule by an oligarchy? Rule by a corrupt few? Rule by individuals sometimes who comprise the mob, as they did in Athens? And in ruling as a mob, they constitute democracy, rule by the demos, rule by a mob, all going to extremes. Let's avoid those extremes. What we want, Aristotle says, is a rule of the middle class that he calls not a democracy, because democracy from his point of view is too subject to mob and not to reason ruling, not an oligarchy ruled by the wealth, but rather a polity, as he calls it. And what is the virtue of the polity in contrast to Plato's meritocracy? The virtue of the polity, number one, most important, it's attainable, it's practical, it can be achieved, because we see in certain states Athens at one particular time when a group of middle class individuals did manage to rule. What are the qualifications of rule? First of all, you've got to be a man. Second, you must have some property. Third, you must be literate. In contrast to the democracy that ruled Athens during the time that Socrates was put away, when that democracy, anyone could go into the assembly, propose any measure, those people illiterate, without property, and so untrustworthy. We don't want those, nor do we want the oligarchs that took over Athens at one time, too. Who do we want? We want reasonable individuals, middle-class types, bourgeois types who will be able to rule effectively because they have a stake in the system, they're sane, they observe the mean, they have their roots in property and a proper sense of family value. Putting aside the argument about women, isn't Aristotle right and Plato wrong in terms of the second two points, that is, his refutation of Plato's second and third waves? Isn't he right in terms of putting his finger on an important point, and that is that we enjoy wealth, we enjoy our children, 
We make them our own. And is there anything wrong with that? And isn't he right in striking and stressing the dangers of rule by a few? Because so quickly can a few philosophers degenerate into a bunch of oligarchs. Whenever we concentrate power, Aristotle says, in the hands of a few, aren't we always going to run the risk then of the rule of tyrants and demagogues? When we look around the world today, isn't Aristotle vindicated more and more by international events that have happened in Eastern Europe and elsewhere? Recently, of course, we saw that the Soviet Constitution is allowing people to have private property now. Isn't it true that countries like China that experimented with property less polities with the abolition of private property fail Aristotle vindicated over and over again he is the middle class philosopher he is the granddaddy of the bourgeois types he is in an archetypal sense the one who sanctions capitalism but isn't he right and in being right he is observing a mean that every country, every polity strives for. Aristotle is saying then this finally, beware of those revolutionaries. They're really dangerous. And they're dangerous for one big reason. It's not that they're innocent. It's not that they're gullible. It's not that they're naive. It's that they go to extremes. They go always to an excess. If we allow that to happen again and again, then Plato's polity, for all of its grand intentions, will wind up as a tyranny. It seems to me that Aristotle is the philosopher, maybe not for all seasons, but certainly for today's season, because he stresses the value of the mean. It's that gesture, and not the gesture on high. It's that gesture that counts. We look to Aristotle, then, for wisdom. We look to him for a solid, sound critique of Plato, we look to him for a kind of vision that will allow us to be corrupted by power.